I'm reading from The Undiscovered Self by C.G. Young, page 55. Ultimately, everything depends on the quality of the individual, but the fatally short-sighted habit of our age is to think only in terms of large numbers and mass organizations. Though, though one would think that the world had seen more than enough of what a well-disciplined mob can do in the hands of a single madman. Unfortunately, this realization does not seem to have penetrated very far, and our blindness in this respect is extremely dangerous. People go on blithely organizing and believing in the sovereign remedy of mass action without the least consciousness of the fact that the most powerful organizations can be maintained only by the greatest ruthlessness of their leaders and the cheapest of slogans. Curiously enough, the churches too want to avail themselves of mass action in order to cast out the devil with Beelzebub. The very churches whose care is the salvation of the individual soul. They too do not appear to have heard anything of the elementary axiom of mass psychology that the individual becomes morally and spiritually inferior in the mass, and for this reason they do not burden themselves over much with their real task of helping the individual to achieve a metanoia or a rebirth of the spirit. It is unfortunately only too clear that if the individual is not truly regenerated in spirit, society cannot be either for society is the sum total of individuals in need of redemption. I can therefore see it only as a delusion when the churches try, as they apparently do, to rope the individual into a social organization and reduce him to a condition of diminished responsibility, instead of raising him out of the torpid mindless mass and making clear to him that he is the one important factor and that the salvation of the world consists in the salvation of the individual soul. It is true that mass meetings parade such ideas before him and seek to impress them on him by dint of mass suggestion, with the unedifying result that when the intoxication has worn off, the mass man promptly succumbs to another even more obvious and still louder slogan. His individual relation to God would be an effective shield against these pernicious influences. Did Christ ever call his disciples to him at a mass meeting? Did the feeding of the 5,000 bring him any followers who did not afterwards cry, crucify him with the rest, when even the rock named Peter showed signs of wavering? And are not Jesus and Paul prototypes of those who, trusting their inner experience, have gone their own individual ways, disregarding public opinion? This argument should certainly not cause us to overlook the reality of the situation confronting the church. When the church tries to give shape to the amorphous mass by uniting individuals into a community of believers, with the help of suggestion and tries to hold such an organization together. It is not only performing a great social service, but it also secures for the individual the inestimable boon of a meaningful life form. These, however, are gifts which, as a rule, confirm certain tendencies and do not change them. As experience unfortunately shows, the inner man remains unchanged however much community he has. His environment cannot give him as a gift that which he can win for himself only with effort and suffering.